hope everyone is well this morning. As you can see, I'm not Brother Smith. He'll, he'll be here for uh, church, I believe, but uh, <clears throat> I count it an honor to fill in. I can't fill in. Nobody can replace Brother Smith. I think, don't y'all think? This is how I feel. We have a wonderful uh, pastor that's also a, a great Bible teacher. I've learned so many different things from him. And uh, so we're going to miss him this morning. But I'm glad you're here. We got a lot of work done yesterday. This is going to be an ongoing project. As you can see, there's more tiles that we've taken up. And hopefully, hopefully, um, probably not next week, but hopefully the week after, we're going to start mm, possibly putting down some more tiles. We'll see. It's a big job. It's a big job. But it's like everything else. It's like serving God or putting down a new floor. If you don't have a good foundation, all your labors will be in vain. I wanted to talk a little bit this morning, the difference between duplicate and restored. It sounds like they're the same thing. Did you know the word duplicate is not mentioned in the Bible? Not one time, not one time. You can look it up if you have a concordance. You can Google it. Duplicate is not mentioned in the Bible. But the word restore and restored and restoring is. And there's a big difference between the two. There are several people. Uh, in fact, it's, it's quite the fad nowadays to collect these little cars at different scales, 1 16th inch per foot. And, 132nd and the more expensive ones uh, the little steering, steering wheels turn and when they turn the wheels turn back and forth and if it's a convertible the convertible open up the doors open up they're quite expensive some of them even big you can pay thousands of dollars they're called duplicates but you know what you, you open the little hood and it has an engine in there but it's not a real engine so it's, it's just a duplicate it looks identical to the real thing, but it's just a duplicate. It's not the real thing. There's many people that try to duplicate things today, uh, all, all different kinds of things. And duplication just simply means you're making something that looks similar to that item you're trying to duplicate, but it's not the real thing. You're trying to duplicate the real thing. And now, Restore or restored, because we're going to read in uh, Psalms. In fact, while we're talking about this, uh, I want everybody to turn over to Psalms 69, uh, the, the 69th uh, chapter of Psalms. It mentions the word restored. Duplicate means that you look at something and you copy it. Yeah. Did you know, and I like I like keeping up with current events. They make little handguns right now that are exact duplicates of certain types of other handguns. And people have actually been arrested because these handguns, they're plastic. They don't shoot, they don't have a fire, you know, firing pin, uh, but, but they look identical. They look identical. Uh, but it's not the real thing. And these are the exact same size. I'll give you a little story. And uh, even things that are duplicated, you may not know that they're a duplicate and that they won't work. Years ago, when I was working for Springfield Public Schools, I was in one of our big high schools. And we had just had a, not at our school, uh, District Springfield uh, Public Schools, but it was in another state. There, were, there had been a shooting in a school in some other state. Well, we were all put on high, on high alert, and uh, we were all a little bit antsy because we all thought it's just a matter of time before something like that happens here. Thankfully, at the school districts around here and the one I came from, they haven't had a shooting with casualties yet. But I, I was walking down this hallway 
big wide hallway. It's probably about 15 foot wide. It was a big school, about 2,500 kids. And I had to check something. So I walked into this restroom and I checked something there and I came out and when I did, I looked down the hallway because the hallway was empty except there was something out of the corner of my eye and I caught it and it was movement. And I took one step out of the restroom and I looked over like this and this, I didn't know if it was a student or because this person is, they're probably at least a hundred foot away. Okay, big school, okay, long hallway. I looked down there and he is carrying, it looks like a shotgun. And I thought it, instantly, y y your mind goes into, what am I gonna do? I thought, and, and he looked, he saw movement out of his eye and, and he's walking across the hall carrying the gun like this and he saw me out of the corner of my, uh, his eyes and he turned his head and he looked at me. I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I said, do I charge him? Do I run back into the bathroom? What do I do? And he smiled at me. I thought, this is a little bit strange. And, and he turned and he smiled at me. And this, I could tell even from the distance where we were at, the stock was made out of wood and the barrel looked like it was black. But when he turned like this, now the gun is pointing at me. And then he smiled at me. I thought, well, this is it. This is it. But adrenaline kicks in, and adrenaline is an amazing thing. It was like, you ever seen in a movie, somebody sees something terrible, and instantly everything zooms in, and everything is black around you except that one little thing? It was like I had tunnel vision uh, with binoculars, and when he turned, I could see that that wasn't a real gun. From the side, it looked like a real gun, but when he turned, I could see that the barrel was not thick enough, even from that distance. Don't ask me how I could tell. Your mind is just working in survival mode. I could see that wasn't a real gun because the barrel was, it looked like it was cardboard thin and he walked across the hall. So I knew it wasn't a real gun. So I went and I spoke to the principal and the, uh, the drama teacher almost lost his job over that. Uh, this was in a time when you weren't supposed to have any guns or handguns, and this was, uh, what is that? Uh, they were doing a musical, and it's uh, Oklahoma. Y'all ever seen that musical, Oklahoma? They, they carried this gun around, and they had made the stock in, in wood sh uh, shop, and then they'd, you know, from a distance, it was a good duplicate, and it scared me until I until he turned to me, I could tell it was a duplicate. But if it would have been the real thing, the difference between a duplicate and one that's restored, if he had restored a gun, if he, it, and, and he would have turned toward me, I could have seen that barrel is a real barrel because it's been restored. There's people that take old rifles and old pistols and they restore them, they still fire, they still work, they're not duplicates. They're the real thing. They're the real thing. So that's, that's a lot of the difference between duplicate that you don't find in the Bible and restored which you do find in the Bible. When I first came to the body there was a man this was in Texas and I almost got tired of him asking me but he felt like it was his uh, duty to try and get me to think along this line. It was a man that went to the church in the middle and Odessa area and I, every time I'd see him for a long time he'd say why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Well, I thought, well, yeah, I was just fresh out of uh, the nominal church. I said, that's easy to for, forgive people of sins. He said, really? And, and then he made me think about it. And later I found out Jesus had the ability to, to forgive people of sins even before he died on the cross. I'm not gonna get on that subject, but he made me think uh, along those lines. So let's turn over to Psalms 69, verse 4. In fact, by the way, we are going to, this is going to, this is going to, that would be a big Bible study, just, and, and Brother Smith has done it before. It's quite a Bible study. 
Why did Jesus come? Did you know there's three instances in the New Testament before Jesus went to the cross where he forgave people of their sins? In one place he, he said, Be of good cheer, your sins have been forgiven you. And that upset the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they said, Who is this? Only God can forgive sins. But even the Old Testament, with all their uh, sacrifices and rituals that they had, if they committed a sin, whether knowingly or unknowingly, they could take a, an offering. If you was a, a poor person, you would take a handful of maybe of meal. But if you were a rich person uh, or, or even a, a priest or the Levite, you may take a, a bullock, depending upon the severity of the sin, what it was, and your social status and how much money you had and you would take it and you'd offer it up and your sins would be forgiven so it's not necessarily Jesus didn't come just to forgive people of sins there was something much more important it's important that your sins be forgiven but we're going to read here in Psalms 69 and we'll start in the first verse. Let's see. It says, this is, this one thing you have to understand about prophetic uh, scriptures in the Old Testament, especially Psalms. Sometimes it's just a praise unto God. Sometimes it will contain uh, prophecies about Christ and about the early church or down here, the latter rain church, it'll be talking about prophetic scriptures. Uh, and then at other times, it's just talking about David or another occurrence in his life. You have to, that's why Bible studies are so important. You have to come so that you start to know the difference between what's prophetic, what's poetical. Uh, is it talking about us here? Brother Smith is going to be getting into Matthew 24 real quick. And that's a wonderful Bible study, by the way. Most of religion believes that Matthew 24 was talking about all, everything that it talks about happened down there. Well, uh, or, or excuse me, it's going to happen up here. People are so self-centered, and they've been doing this. People are just naturally self-centered, you know. It's just like we've had, it's been such a blessing to have Owen with us uh, for a short while. We've been able to watch him grow a little bit. But as much as we love the little guy, he's so self-centered. <laughs> he, oh, there he is. There he is. Hi, Owen. Raise your hand. Yeah. Say hi, Papa. Hi. <laughs> That's just human nature. Human nature is to be self-centered, that everything is about you. When he wants to eat, the world comes to a stop, and you better feed him, or he's going to let you know real quick. You know? Or if he wants to play. It's, you got to play his way, you know, or the world comes to a stop. That's the human nature we're all born with. We're all born with that natural mind. And unless God can get a hold of us and start training us to go a certain direction, a different direction, we'll always stay in that just natural mind. We'll never have a spiritual mind. But that's why Bible studies are so important because a lot of people think uh, Matthew 24. We don't. Maybe some of you do. But when, when Brother Smith gets done with his Bible study on Matthew 24, you're going to say, yeah, yeah, I understand that very well. But everybody thinks that's all going to happen down here. They think every, uh, they even wrote a song, every, every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. Did you know a lot of what's contained in here? We can use it and we can apply it, but that's not be what it may not be what that prophecy was intended for. There was a lot of scriptures here for the New Testament church, and it doesn't even apply down here. And there's other things that are meant to be used down here to lead us and guide us and direct us in the time that we're living in that had nothing to do with the early church. That's why Bible studies are so important, uh, to learn the Word of God. It's like the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
So anyway, in Psalms chapter 69, it says, Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. This happens to be uh, a prophetical scriptures about Christ coming as a little baby and then growing up. And when he turned 30 years old, God had him in a place where he started his ministry. Uh, Isaiah 40 is another good chapter. It's all talking about back there. There's a lot of scriptures that talk about back there. This is talking about back there. We can apply some of these things. This scripture that I'm going to read here in a minute, we can use it down here, but it was meant for the people there. It says, They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. Some of us don't have very many enemies. <laughs> Brother Mark, you don't have very much. <laughs> It says, they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies, wrongfully. He was talking about the Jewish people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Essians. Being mine enemies wrongfully, they are mighty. Then, I love this, then I restored that which I took not away. And you say, what? are you talking about what did he restore what did Jesus restore that he didn't take away you have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis when when Christ uh, created Adam out of the, the dirt of the earth he was uh, and that's there's a lot of symbolism there I believe to this day I still believe that God created Adam out of the dirt of the earth uh, but there's there's symbolism too. Earthy talks about your natural mind, your your carnal nature. We were all that's uh, how is it? Uh, someone look up that scripture. It says, uh, "But ye are of the earth." Uh, you know which one I'm talking about. Look that up real quick. God, God formed man out of the dust of the earth and he breathed into Adam the breath of life I believe that when when God see Christ was was born he had the Holy Ghost that's how he was conceived as that little seed brother Smith has gone over that when, when brother uh, painter gets that uh, we'll put that up on the board about but uh, uh, which one is it? But ye are of the earth, earthy. That one's. Uh, is that not it? That's Psalm 69. I think this is either in James. Huh? Oh. The first man of, is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Let me tell you what I think about Adam. And that when God created Adam. He had to breathe into him the breath of life. Did you know you can be walking around today without the breath of life of God in your life? And that just means you are of the earth, earthy, devilish, sensual. In another place it says uh, earthly, sensual, devilish, those things. Until God breathes into you, which is not so much natural life, but a spiritual life. In Isaiah the 40th chapter, verse 1 through about 10, it says this. It says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And it's talking about getting the Holy Ghost. In fact, Jesus told his disciples before he went into Jerusalem to be crucified and hung on the cross. He said, he said, tear ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power on high. And, of course, John the 17th chapter, it says, you know, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be, may, you may be also in my father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. We all know that that's talking about the Holy Ghost. 
And in fact, before Christ went to Jerusalem to be hung on the cross, he blew on them. In fact, they wanted to know, they had a lot of questions for Christ. And in one place, it looks like Christ just blew them off. And it says, this is what you need to know. And he blew on them. And he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's how important it was. That was that's the same thing as God did to Adam. He breathed into Adam the breath of life. That word comfort in Isaiah 40 means uh, a heavy breath or a sigh. And uh, in Acts chapter 1, Christ, after he was resurrected uh, from the grave, and he was, with, he, he was with his disciples and other people for another 40 days. And he, he, he appeared on to many. And uh, they wanted to know, in fact, let's turn over to, before we finish this up here, turn over to Acts chapter 1 real quick. This is really important. That used to be in the Bible. Acts. Let's see here. All right. All right. Let's start. Because this, this, this is important. What he came to restore that which he took not away. And we're going to get back to that. But Acts chapter 1, first verse. This will give you a little background of what... Uh, uh, they're talking about the former treaty have I made O Theopolis of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God he's already in his glorified body and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Christ in in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, he breathed upon his disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, but they didn't receive it yet because Christ was not crucified and glorified and ascended up to heaven. And on the day of Pentecost, he came back to his people in a mighty way. On the day of Pentecost, there was about 120 people uh, gathered together, and there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. Same thing that you see in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, where it says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, which means uh, a heavy breath or a sigh. <sighs> there was a sound as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the chambers where they were in, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And he told them before Acts that this is important for you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you, and that place was the body of Christ. Assemblies in the body of Christ and he's preparing a place so that he can send back the comforter on the day of Pentecost. Before then, Adam had the Holy Ghost. But Adam, Adam, Adam sinned willfully and he lost that place in God and he was removed from that garden-like experience that we're trying to get back into. Remember that garden experience, that garden where Adam, Adam and Eve was in? Today, if the church was restored, this right here could be a garden. Even though it's downstairs at the church, a garden experience is not where you are. It's where you are in God. It all has to do with your relationship with God. And if the church is restored and your right relationship with him, you can be at work and be in a garden. That just simply means that you're walking in the fullness uh, of the manifestation of Christ, that there's a full manifestation of all of his powers, the power of the Holy Ghost, powers of the world to come, his ministry, and, 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 and the Holy Ghost, and in the Word of God. So this could be a garden. A garden is not where you have trees and other things. 
a garden is wherever God is and you are in a right condition in him at the right time. So Christ blew on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. But they couldn't receive the Holy Ghost yet because when Adam sinned, there was no way. Man could get their sins forgiven through sacrifices. And I told you there was three times in the New Testament where Christ forgave people's sins without even going to the cross. There was already a mechanism in place. But man needed more than just the forgiveness of sins. There has to be, he had to go to prepare a place for them, like Christ said, so that where I am, not necessarily where I am right now, because Christ was standing, he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am now. Well, why would you want to prepare a place and just move three feet and stand where Christ is standing right now? That's why he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. It would do you no good just to say, okay, Christ, move over a little bit because where you're at, I want to be there right there. It's talking about a condition. And so all through the New Testament, he was getting his disciples and those 120 people ready for the day of Pentecost. And he wanted them to let them know through uh, everything he had been through that there is something that's going to happen. I'm going to restore something that has not been on this earth for 4,000 years, which is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Until you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you can get forgiven of sins. You can come to church right now and not have the Holy Ghost, and you can kneel down at the altar and get your sins forgiven. When that happened to me when I was 16 years old, oh, what an experience I had. Wonderful experience. I just felt a load of sin lift up off of me. I didn't have the Holy Ghost. I didn't get the Holy Ghost at that time. I didn't speak in tongues at that time. So... My sins were forgiven, and Christ can do that, and God can still do that, but it doesn't say that he came to restore forgiveness of sins. It says Christ came to restore that which he took not away, which was that condition in God where you can receive the Holy Ghost. Without the Holy Ghost, your inner man, you can change what you look like on the outside to a certain extent. You can change the way you respond to people, you can change how you look, you can how, change how you react to people. Someone in the Wilburton Church a long time ago, they said, I may be sitting down on the, in, on the outside, but on the inside, I'm standing up. That's what, that takes a work of the Holy Ghost to give you a new nature. That's what... Uh, it says, let that mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who was meek and lowly, humble and holy, all those other things. And that we're to put, in, put on his nature and we're, we're to become like him. You can't do it without the Holy Ghost. And you can't do it ultimately without the full manifestation of the Holy Ghost. We have wonderful manifestations now of the Holy Ghost. Oh, we've had some other ones. But we don't yet have a full manifestation of the Holy Ghost is our nature changing? Thank God that I'm not the same person that I was. I've had almost 50 years. I almost had the Holy Ghost 50 years, Sister Crow. Almost 50 years will be next year. How long have you had the Holy Ghost? A little bit more than 50 years. She's had the Holy Ghost a long time. My nature is changing. But the only reason, and what's happening is, I'm, God has helped me to sit down on the outside. I've learned how to treat people the right way. I don't always do the best job, but I'm trying. I've, uh, God's helped me to learn how to be more faithful, how to be not angry, and all these other things. So there's many times you can see me, and I've made my flesh sit down. But on the inside, oh, earthly, sensual, devilishness. All that's in the world, John said, is earthly, sensual, devilish. You can have your sins forgiven and still be filled with earthly, sensual, devilish things. It takes God and Jesus 
moving into your heart through the Holy Ghost, like it says in John 17. And then that starts to fill up your life. And you just find yourself becoming more and more like him. The more that you serve him, the more that you turn your life over to him, uh, you're going to act like him. Your mindset's going, you're going to think like him. You're going to treat people. And the less and less you're going to find that carnal nature. And that's, this is what it says. It says, the carnal mind is the enemy of God. Neither can it receive the things of God. Your car, people with a carnal mind out there, they can learn. There's many people, uh, the Jews, the Jews, they were taught the Old Testament. And, and the Pharisees and Sadducees, they knew it back and forth. They, they could quote everything out of there. They, they knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. But Jesus said this. He said, you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you can know the word of God. And they had ways to get their sins forgiven, which was good. But yet they were earthly, sensual, devilish because... Christ hadn't restored what he took water away. He said this about the Jewish people and the Pharisees. He said, you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And then in one place he said, for you walk over graves not knowing that they're dead, they're full of dead man's bones and they're whited sepulchers. He said, you won't let anybody go. You won't go in. In other words, they wouldn't come in and receive what Christ was saying. When, they, when the Pharisees heard things about this, they rejected it. Earthly, sensual, devilish. The carnal mind cannot receive the things of God. It can't do it. And, and, and so, so you can get your sins. There was a, a mechanism down there to get your sins forgiven, just like there is down here today. But until you get the Holy Ghost that our great-grandfather Adam willingly gave up, when Adam sinned will, willingly, God cast him out of that condition. He no longer had that place in God like he did uh, when it says that he walked in the cool of the evening. He walked with Christ uh, because God made man out of the dust of the earth. You and I are made out of the dust of the earth until we get the Holy Ghost. All that's in our life is the carnal, natural nature. And it can't be changed. The old man... And that's a good study on itself. The Bible talks much about the old man. It can't be changed. It has to be killed. That's the nature that you're born with. But what happens is when you get the Holy Ghost, the more that Holy Ghost is formed down inside of you, the less room there is for the old man, for that carnal nature. Until finally, one day, you'll have a new nature just like Christ had. So when our great-grandfather Adam sold us down the road, even though there was a mechanism to give people of sins, they needed something more. They needed that condition that Adam walked in before he sinned. He came, Christ came to restore that. Christ didn't take that away. Let's go back. Oh, wait, we're, let me finish reading this before we run out of time. It says... Uh, he says in verse 6 in Acts chapter 1, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore is, uh, again the kingdom to Israel? See, they, this is the wrong restoration that they wanted. They wanted a natural restoration of the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus kind of blew them off because in his mind he was thinking, you need to listen to me because I'm going to impart something onto you that's much, much greater than just the natural restoration of Israel. This is what I came to do, he said. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But then he went on to the main focus of what he came to do. He said, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come unto you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And he told them right there what they needed right now was not a natural restoration of Israel. They didn't know. They didn't need to know more doctrine. They didn't need to know all these other things. He, I, no doubt uh, he looked at them and said, you need to receive the Holy Ghost. This is what I came to restore, that condition 
that paradise condition so that you could move into it so that where I am in that condition in, Christ, in God, you can be there also. We're going to run out of time, so uh, let's see. We were, we were reading in Psalms. Let's go back and read Psalm 69.4 again. Psalm 69. Used to have Psalms in the Bible. It's those flute players, I'm telling you. Well, I want to read it one more time. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in onto my soul. It's talking about Christ. I sink in deep mire. They, they had one, in one place, the people from the area where Christ was born, they said, well, this is, this is, this is the son of Joseph. Who does he think he is? And they took him, up, took him up on the top of the hill to throw him off, but God delivered him. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were sending people to try and trick him. They were trying to trip him up. He said, I sink in deep mire. That was that religion, that Jewish religion back there. That, that Jesus, Jesus finally, at one place, the Jewish religion, the, the leaders of the Jewish religion, uh, two of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, don't you know you offended them? And you know what Jesus said? He said, let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. He had done everything God sent John the Baptist to try to, to reach them. And then Christ came. One place it says, you've piped. we piped, and you haven't danced. You know, we fasted, you haven't fasted. He said, therefore, wisdom is justified of her children. Cried to, God tried to manifest his will and his plan for the Jewish nation and to show them what was going to be restored. But many people rejected it. So this, it says, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. That religion back there had finally got to the place there was no foundation left in it. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. In one place, when they had Barabbas and Jesus up in front of uh, Herod, and Herod wanted to know, who, who, will, who, who will I deliver from this terrible crucifixion, Christ or Barabbas? Everybody said, give us Barabbas, crucify him, crucify him. And all the Jews wanted him crucified. You talk about deep waters. It says, they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head, that they would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully. They're mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. That's talking about on the day of Pentecost when he came back in that rushing mighty wind and filled uh, that place where they sat with, uh, with his spirit and it filled all those with the Holy Ghost and they all spoke in tongues and they prophesied. That's what he came to restore. That's what he came to do. And I'm so thankful for that. You can't duplicate that. There's people, and in fact, there's people. God is restoring the church today and he's restoring the message in this body. We have a wonderful message. And God is restoring things right now, the, the hope, uh, the powers. Many people have come in to the body of Christ and they hear a little bit of this message or maybe they hear a lot of it and they think, well, I like everything they're saying except these two things or I don't like this doctrine. I'm going to leave and I'm going to duplicate what they're doing. You can't duplicate this. I don't care how hard you try. You can't duplicate what God is doing in the body. It can't, it, it, it's, it's false. It, uh, oh, excuse me, it can be duplicated, but you can't replicate it. I got that wrong. God has one body. That's what it says in Ephesians 4. It says, for the, there's one body, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one Lord. You can't replicate what God is doing today. Many people try to duplicate it, but it doesn't work. You got to be where God is 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 restoring uh, what He's doing. Anyway, we're almost out of time, and I was just getting wound up. I, I had a whole bunch of scriptures here, but when you get talking, you find out that there's this message is so big. I guess what I'm saying is, we're in the right place. 
we are in the right place. I, I fully believe with all my heart there's going to be millions, millions of people in the Catholic religion, in the Episcopal religion, in the Protestant religion, in the Pentecostal religion that are going to flow into a restored church, not a duplicated church. It's being duplicated out there, but it will not produce everlasting lies, life and peace and joy like what God is restoring today. There's going to be millions, and I can see it. And Actually, I'm glad we're getting the church ready. You know, one of these days, this church ain't going to be big enough, you know, this church here, you know, it'll be a satellite church. We're going to have to find another church that'll hold about five or 6,000 people because we got such a message. We have such a hope. We have such a love for people. And as God continues to restore this message uh, and uh, everything else, you're going to see a hunger grow in people. And they're going to do two things. They're either going to flow into a church that's being duplicated, a.k.a. the beast, it's a duplicate. It's a duplicate. But you know what God's going to do with that duplicate? It'll be judged and it'll be burnt. But there's going to be millions of people that are going to flow into the body of Christ. They're going to come in. They're going to get this message. They're going to get the Holy Ghost. God's going to plant a love for this in their heart. Like Brother Smith had said, they're going to come in. They're, they're going to, God's going to settle them down. They're going to strengthen them. God will establish them. And then ultimately... God's going to perfect him. That's what Paul said. After you have suffered a while, the Lord make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. It's going to. And you know what? We have a blessing to be some of the first fruits. I was telling my wife here the other day, yeah, we got to work hard, but somebody has to work hard to prepare a place for, for God's people. And we are so blessed. There's something special. If you're here today, there's something special in every one of your lives that God knows he can take and he can mold into a building that God's people can flow into and find safety. That should make you feel good, doesn't it? Amen. Yes, yes. It, it, did you have a message? Oh, you're okay. Actually, what I thought when you did that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with this little, I could keep talking about this for a long time, but there was this, <laughs> there was this Protestant minister and he got a job as a lifeguard, and he uh, he only lasted two days. They fired him, and uh, the reason was so many people drowned because he would sit up there on his little chair. He said, "Yes, I see that hand. Yes, thank you. I see that hand. Yes, thank you." You don't get it, do you? <laughs> All right, uh, it's time. Uh, it's time for Bible uh, uh, for band practice upstairs. Uh, all I want to say is, let's keep that Holy Ghost. Brother Smith has been giving the Word of God, and I appreciate that so much, but let's keep that Holy Ghost flowing in our life. We need that. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank you for listening.